Welcome back, folks. This is the final video lecture for CRN 21940, 21971, and 21972. This video lecture is for module six, which contains essay number four, and that is due a week from today on Monday, May 6th, or sorry, May 2nd. <clears throat> And as you can see in this last module, the broad overarching topic is confronting sexual difference. If you were to click on in the module, this essay guide, you'll be presented with this document, <clears throat> which shows you that again, it is due a week from today, Monday, May 2nd. So this should be no surprise that uh, Page one here contains the exact same outline as essay one, two, and three. Uh, the only difference is the topic that you choose. So on uh, the second page of this guide, there are 10 possible topics you could choose from. Uh, you could come up with one of your own, but I'm gonna work through two or three of these to give you an idea. Um, there is this site for more information. Uh, it's called the HRC or Human Rights Campaign. You may have seen their logo here. Uh, these two yellow equal bars inside of a blue field, uh, you know, to remind us for equality, right? <clears throat> and it's a nonprofit organization uh, seeking to further equity and inclusion in all, all kinds of realms, right? So for hate crimes and health and um, international and, and so on. Um, so that link is uh, again at the bottom here on uh, page two of the guide. Um, before we look at uh, say this, this first one, for example, should same-sex marriage remain legal throughout the United States or should it be overturned? <clears throat> and then I have this parenthetical note uh, in B stands for nota bene, the scholarly abbreviation for meaning note well or take good note. Um, note well that the US Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage licensing in the case of Obergefell versus Hodges on June 26, 2015. Um, and therefore, by default, all 50 states in the United States currently uh, have the ability to have, you know, gay people, lesbian people, you know, uh, non-conforming people, whatever orientation and their gender identity those marriages uh, sanctioned by the state to be the same equivalent of a heterosexual marriage. So that was not a sort of national or federal law until 2015. But let's say hypothetically you were to choose this topic, you know, should it remain legal? And you wanted to say, for example, no, it should not remain legal because uh, same-sex marriage and homosexuality is an abomination in the eyes of God. Well, let me remind you uh, way back when we began talking about logic and rhetoric uh, in actually module two. <clears throat> so if you remember this PowerPoint presentation, um, what is rhetoric, which formed uh, module two, um, <clears throat> one of the issues that I discussed and we covered in that uh, module was areas, categories that we cannot logically argue. And the first one is facts. We don't argue facts like a historical date. <clears throat> we can, however, argue whether or not that historical date and event is represented fairly, let's say, right? 
another category we cannot logically argue are things that are impossible, like we should invade Mars when we can't even, you know, really much uh, keep a rover there for very long. So you could argue that we in the future might be able to do that, but currently it's not possible. So you can't argue uh, what is impossible. Another category we cannot argue are personal preferences like, you know, chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream or this artist is better than that artist. Um, the only way you can do that in a kind of aesthetic sense, uh, remember aesthetics is the category of philosophy that deals with what is beautiful or good, um, is to try to explain why this artist is better than that artist or this painting is better than that painting or song is better than that song and so on using the same criteria, kind of a comparison contrast. Um, but if you said to someone, you know, like you, you know, you don't know what you're missing if you don't try sushi, uh, their taste beds may never um, like sushi. So you, you can argue all you want, but it's not gonna change their mind. And then finally, the last category that we cannot argue logically are beliefs, uh, particularly religious personal belief. So, you know, there are different gods, Allah, Buddha, um, by the way, actually God and Allah are the same exact God, uh, God of Abraham. Um, however, you can try to understand how people hold those beliefs or understand people with different beliefs. Um, the reason we don't argue, say logically, like in a court of law, uh, personal beliefs is because they're just that they're they're your own belief in the united states we theoretically still have a separation of church and state and you're allowed to worship or not worship uh, whichever deity god you choose so if going back to that uh, that example here of uh, topic one it you know you were to say that same-sex marriage should not remain legal because you're arguing from a religious or biblical Christian point of view, that's a non-starter. In other words, do not do this in your essay. Do not ground um, an anti-LGBT <clears throat> or anti-homosexual argument in a personal belief uh, that is, you know, say tied to the Bible or Christian theology. Because you're asking your audience, the people you're trying to convince to do two things. On the one hand, you're saying, you first of all have to agree that my religion, say Christianity is correct and the way that I'm interpreting it is correct. Um, but just like you would not in a court of law be able to logically argue that, oh, well, judge I you know should be not thrown in prison for drowning my five children because God told me to save them from the devil uh, you know that's a you know personal belief religious um, basis um, that's not going to hold any water with the court the jury or you know the judge uh, I use that example because that actually did occur in Houston uh, over a decade ago a woman drowned not one two three four but five all five of her children in a bathtub and her lawyer's uh, defense was that she was hearing voices uh, from the devil and you know god told her to save her children from the devil uh, yeah that obviously did not work and she was course sentenced. So uh, let me give you an idea of uh, how this works. There is in your uh, folder, that is to say, if you were to go to the, you know, link that says use any of these files as sources in your essay, inside of that uh, folder for essay number four, there is this now classic op-ed opinion editorial uh, piece from the New York Times in 1992 called uh, Homophobic Reread Your Bible. And it's by uh, 
Peter Gomes, as you can see here, he's, he's now deceased, but he was uh, an African-American Baptist minister and he was a professor of Christian morals at Harvard Divinity School. So uh, you have to have some real chops to be, you know, not just a you know a theology professor, but to be a theology professor at uh, Harvard, which is where here Peter Gomes uh, was teaching. And so uh, the article is written by him. Uh, that's Harvard Divinity School. And uh, here he is, you know, sermonizing. So when you read this, keep in mind that on the one hand, he's African American in, you know, a community that often most kind of vociferously and vehemently denounces homosexuality and LGBT uh, people. Uh, but he's also a biblical scholar so that he breaks down very, very clearly and uh, cogently, logically, the arguments that a lot of people use from a religious point of view. Um, he will say here, Christians opposed to political and social equality for homosexual, homosexuals nearly always appeal to the moral injunctions or, you know, uh, moral dictates, if you will, of the Bible, <clears throat> claiming that scripture is very clear on the matter and citing verses that support their opinion, right? You've probably heard people do this. They accuse others of perverting and distorting texts contrary to their clear meaning. Notice that he has that word clear in quotation marks. That is called uh, the use of scare quotes. When you're scaring up or conjuring up an alternative meaning of the word, right? Um, you know, think of uh, what people use as what we call air quotes, you know, when they do their fingers on both hands, right, to signify quotation marks. Um, they're conjuring up, scaring up an alternative, almost opposite meaning of that word. If someone said, uh, oh, I saw uh, Joshua at the club with his, you know, air quote, girlfriend, the word girlfriend is in quotation marks. Therefore, it's not really his girlfriend. It's, you know, his side girl or mistress or something. So he's, he's claiming here that Christians, right? Christians who oppose homosexual, homosexuality and homosexuals believe that they have a clear meaning of the Bible. Um, but he goes on with the next sentence to point out a little bit of hypocrisy on their part by saying, they do not, however, necessarily see quite as clear a meaning in biblical passage on economic conduct, the burdens of wealth, and the sin of greed, which is all certainly in the Bible, right? So he goes on to say where those scriptures are often cited. Nine biblical citations are customarily invoked as relating to homosexuality. Four, Deuteronomy, Kings, and so on. Four simply forbid prostitution by men and women. So go read those four scriptures very closely and in context within you know, each, each of those chapters. Um, and so prostitution is not automatically gay or lesbian or homosexual sex. It could be, but it's not automatically, right? Then he goes on to point out the more sort of common damning, uh, you know, uh, references in Leviticus. Two others, Leviticus 18 and 20, two others are part of what biblical scholars call the holiness codes. And there are many, many of these codes. The code explicitly bans homosexual acts, but it also prohibits eating raw meat, sushi, uh, cream of tartar, you know, which is raw ground up beef, planting two different kinds of seed in the same field like wheat and cotton, and wearing garments with different kinds of yarn, which most of us who have, say, 
a polyester cotton blend shirt on are committing a sin by having you know garments with two different kinds of yarn. Tattoos, adultery, and sexual intercourse during a woman's menstrual period are similarly outlawed. So you should go look at these Leviticus, Leviticus 18 and 20 to see a whole list of things that you should not do, including tattoo your body, marking your body. So if any of you have any kind of body modifications or you know ink, uh, you have committed a sin, which he's pointing out is hypocritical for people to say, well, I'm going to obey this particular, you know, law or code about homosexuality. It's an abomination, right? Uh, but I'm not going to worry about eating shellfish like clams, mussels, or, you know, uh, crawfish for that matter, uh, which is also forbidden in this Leviticus. Um, and this, this always strikes me when people say they are Christian, underscore the word Christ in that word, they are Christian, and they say, well, you know, Jesus would, would not condone Christianity, right? Well, Gomes points out here, there is no mention of homosexuality in the four Gospels of the New Testament. The moral teachings of Jesus are not concerned with the subject. So what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you go read and read them closely, there's absolutely zero mention by Christ and, you know, in those gospels of anything about homosexuality. Later, after Christ is dead, Paul, one of his disciples, writes a number of letters. Um, but Gomes is pointing out that he was against, Paul was against lust and sensuality in anyone, including heterosexuals. So, it's taking, you know, biblical scripture out of context and using it for your own purposes, what we might call selective interpretation. And to drive his point home here, he discusses the incident in the Old Testament, Old Testament in Ezekiel of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you've ever read the story, and I invite you to go back and read it and read it closely and within context, it is not about homosexuality, though it could be read or interpreted as a homosexual act of violence, but we don't know exactly uh, what becomes of the stranger, that we just know that he was sexually abused. Um, what he's going to point out here is that this story is not about, uh, you know, the story of Son of Gomorrah is not about the wickedness of the people, although that's certainly part of it, it's really ultimately about what he calls the inhospitality of people. Uh, it says here, behold, he's quoting here as a scripture, behold, this was the iniquity, iniquity meaning wickedness of thy sister, Sodom, pride, fullness of bread or gluttony, an abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters, her meaning the city of Sodom. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And he goes on to say, to suggest that Sodom and Gomorrah is about sexual, homosexual sex is an analysis of about as much worth as suggesting that the story of Jonah and the whale is a treatise on fishing, which if you've read, <coughs> excuse me, the story of Jonah, it's not at all about fishing or the whale, really. It's about Jonah not doing what God wants and running away from, from God. So uh, keep in mind that, again, if you wanted to argue any of these from a religious point of view, it's not going to be easy and you just really shouldn't do it. You can, of course, <coughs> excuse me, argue that it should not be remain legal for other reasons, right? Like, Here's an example. Uh, let's say you choose, uh, excuse me, chose uh, topic number four. Should same-sex couples be allowed to adopt? Well, believe it or not, uh, in many states, it's difficult for same-sex couples, male-male or female-female couples to adopt because of the way that the adoption agencies are set up in the state and the kind of 
often religiously associated um, agencies that uh, often do the adoptions. So you could, if you say no, same-sex couples should not be allowed to adopt, while you could not logically argue it on a you know, moral Christian theological point of view, you could say, well, I don't think uh, they should adopt because it could cause mental health issues and ostracization of the child when they're growing up. Um, you know, there is no evidence in the what I'm about to say, but some people want to argue that, well, it will cause that child, let's say, for example, uh, it's a male male couple and they adopt a male child, uh, it's going to cause that uh, son of theirs to become gay, uh, to like men because they see that it's okay to like men. Uh, or if it's a female female parenting couple and they adopt a female, then she's going to be lesbian. Or that if they adopt a boy, then the boy's going to become effeminate and gay because there's not a man around. So if you want to make claims like that, folks, you are required, right, as these three body paragraphs show, you're required to provide facts and evidence, right? You cannot simply just throw out a general statement. So if you were to say, well, you know, in a thesis statement, uh, same-sex couples should not be allowed to uh, adopt because it might harm the mental health of the child. Uh, it might make him or her, the child, gay. And three, uh, you know, there needs to be, from a traditional nuclear family standpoint, which also has religious you know, ramifications and, and, and valence, uh, there needs to be a man or a woman in the house. Uh, though neither of those are true. But if you're going to make those kinds of claims in number two and three, then you be, better be able to actually provide some evidence of that claim, not simply just say it, right? Because again, you're trying to convince your audience that you're right. So um, let's take another one, for example, should there be an officially recognized inclusive LGBTQI plus organization at Grambling or GSU? I mention this because uh, there is not one at Grambling and you know, notice the name Grambling State University, right? It is a state university and therefore a public university. It's not religiously affiliated with you know, the Catholic church or the Baptist church. Um, and therefore anyone, you know, in state, out of state can attend this publicly funded institution. However, there is not a uh, LGBTQI plus organization or gambling. Before I came to, uh, to Grambling, I taught at a place in Cincinnati called Xavier University, not to be confused with the one in, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the one in New Orleans called Xavier University of Louisiana. Uh, this is the original one and found in 1831. Um, so it's part of what the campus looks like. Uh, it says here, it is, a Jesuit Catholic university. Therefore, it is deliberately, right? It is, as it says here, founded in 1831. It is the oldest Catholic college in Ohio. And it remains so, right? Catholic university. So you would think, well, oh, um, this university is a Christian identified university. Um, because Catholicism is considered like the original Christian religion, uh, that it would be, you know, anti-gay or, you know, it'd be homophobic. But in fact, it's not. There is, um, I think they still call it the Alliance. My son. Hmm. 
it's not uh, coming up. It's making me look bad here. Uh, It's, it's as though their search engine does not work at all. Bizarre. Uh, so, hmm. here's another way to do this. Uh, There it is, uh, Lazar. Um, so they do actually have, um, you know, a whole bunch of, um, you know, resources um, for people who are, you know, LGBTQI plus. Um, so, you know, it's under the aegis of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, because they, this university really takes to heart, uh, it's kind of a sense of social justice, actually. In fact, I have a whole degree in uh, social justice. Um, but yeah, that's my, my point about, so if, you know, a Catholic affiliated university has you know, an open policy about LGBTQI plus people, then why isn't there one at Grambling? Should there be, should it not be? Why, why not, right? Um, here's a fairly new issue at hand. It's not really new, but it's, I should say it's become more, uh, the, the bell, if you will, is being rung louder and louder in recent years on this issue, should transgender athletes, student athletes be allowed to compete on teams that correspond to their current gender as opposed to their biological sex at birth. Um, so there are a lot of um, students, especially student athletes who do not want say a male to female transgender person, whether in high school or college to be on their female or women's say soccer team or tennis team or whatever women's team uh, or vice versa, you know, to have uh, a female to male transgender person be on their men's baseball team. Um, so if you wanna argue that they should not, that transgender student athletes should not be allowed, then you need to provide, again, evidence in your main body paragraphs, paragraphs three, four, and five, of why they should not be. And that's going to take some digging into the science, the bio biological science of it. And the, the problem though, is it's a fairly new, phenomenon of uh, trying to gauge, you know, how, you know, how much is too much, for example, testosterone. So when uh, Olympic athletes in say, I don't know, shot put, um, if you, you know what that uh, sport is, right? Um, it's a very physical sport where by you, uh, you know, are throwing this fairly heavy ball, right? So if you wanted to say, for example, this woman, and you can tell she's a woman, uh, that she should not be allowed to compete 
because her body contains too much testosterone, which is one of the arguments that people want to make about uh, student athletes, right? Uh, you know, to so say a male to female student athlete uh, should not be on the track team, the women's track team, because they produce too much testosterone and can run faster, right? Uh, then you're going to need to find some evidence for that, right? Not just generalize it. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, Oh yes, number five, should employees be allowed to discriminate against fire or not hire LGBTQ I plus people? Um, there has been uh, for years now, uh, something called the Equality Act, but it has not been ever passed in Congress. Uh, that's uh, House Resolution 2282, as you can see here. Um, it's, it's been around for you know, quite some time, um, right? And if it were passed, it would in, you know, make inclusive and legal uh, all the benefits that uh, heterosexuals get to have in terms of, uh, you know, employment and, uh, you know, and bank loans and everything basically, right? So inside of your folder for this module, uh, Google Drive folder, uh, there's this, uh, again, human, ri human rights campaign uh, set of maps. And it shows you here color coded, um, the places that discriminate, the, the states that discriminate against people based on either their sexual orientation, which, you know, to clarify is who you desire to, you know, sleep with, uh, versus your gender identity, which is how you desire to present your, your body, yourself, your presence. Um, so, if you're in this dark gold here, these states like California and all along the West Coast, they, you're, they prohibit, they do not allow discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Okay, so the West Coast is what we might call progressive. And as is you know, Nevada, uh, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, up near the Great Lakes, you know, Illinois, Michigan. Well, actually not Michigan. Michigan is one of the yellow ones. So it, it only uh, prohibits on sexual orientation. So if you're, you know, uh, say a transgender person, you can be discriminated against in terms of renting a home or an apartment, right? Um, and there's no legal recourse for you. Up here in the Northeast, there are a lot of progressive states, but as you can see, virtually the entire South, including Louisiana, where Grambling is, uh, there's no protection for you being denied renting an apartment or home because you're gay or lesbian or bi or whatever, uh, nor is there any law to protect you uh, from being kicked out of your apartment or home if your landlord finds out that you're LGBT, right? Yeah, I mean, you can try to sue them, but uh, it, there is no state law where that would, uh, you know, be uh, upheld. In employment, the following states in purple, like the West Coast a moment ago, they say you cannot uh, discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender, gender identity in employment. So you cannot be fired or you cannot be not hired. Um, and, you know, that is, you should be allowed to be given the job if you're LGBT. Uh, and the different uh, states here, different color codings, uh, 
break it down differently. But you, again, you can see here the entire cell is what remains what we call a right to work state. That is, um, you know, the uh, employer has the right to hire or fire you for really kind of any reason they want. Uh, you're at the kind of uh, the beck and call and uh, beholden to you, the employer. And similarly, when it comes to, uh, hold on, uh, hate crimes, it's actually just changed. So this is 2017 uh, that we got some hate crime legislation and finally, but uh, you know, you would think that hate crimes, which of course can be not just about race, but it can be a hate crime based on one's, you know, uh, orientation or, or gender identity. Um, that if you're killed because of that, you're, you're gay or you're transgender, um, then that should be considered a hate crime. But uh, most states do not have that kind of uh, you know, provision. Public accommodations, uh, we're talking here about like, you know, the restroom bill or law. Uh, many states, again, you can see here in the South, do not have any kind of allowance for like if you go into a truck stop or a public rest stop uh, and you know let's say it's a classically you know a male to female transgender person and then some woman in the restroom complains that there's a pervert if you will in the women's restroom but it's really a trans person using the restroom which you know what else you're doing in the restroom um, then that woman who was you know incensed and outraged she could try to um you know have that person brought up on indecency charges or something like that but here in the west coast uh, in, in green like there's nothing that could happen but over here you could theoretically be charged with uh, a crime of indecency or you know, exposure, if you will, if you're in a restroom that, you know, doesn't conform to your biological sex, which is one of the questions um, that I have down here, should transgender people use public restrooms that correspond to their appearance? Um, this is a real tricky issue because uh, kind of, in some ways, like, how do you enforce that? Uh, inside of your Google Drive folder, there are a number of uh, images I have here that kind of uh, illustrate what I'm talking about. And so um, what the, the transgender restroom or anti-transgender restroom laws would do is if you were born biologically with penis and testicles, identifying you as male, quote unquote, air quotes, you can't see my, you know, fingers, air quotes, um, then you're supposed to use a restroom that has, you know, urinals. But what if you are physically presenting as, as you can see here, as feminine or female? Well, the law says that you're required to then go into what we would call the men's room. Uh, this person here, I think she's from Canada. She's taking a picture and saying, okay, this is what the law would do. You know, uh, I think most males would go, uh, sorry, I think you're in the wrong restroom, right? Uh, because it's hard to really know, you know, like uh, unless you're checking someone's pants, you know, how do you know what genitals they have or don't have? Um, so kind of awkward, right? <laughs> well, there she is in the men's room taking a picture of herself, but in the back is a person using a urinal. Um, now, what if it was the opposite like this? Uh, this is what we would call a trans man, a female to male trans person. And if ladies, you saw 
a person like this, you know, with a beard and no breasts in the woman's restroom, wouldn't you think that he is in the wrong restroom, right? So uh, it, it's really tricky to, uh, to think about this. Um, and the other images that are in your folder speak to the, you know, the kind of diversity of <clears throat> trans people that are walking among us every day, right? Um, so all of these people you're about to see are transgender people in various stages and paths of what they call their transition. So this is actually, uh, as you can see here, uh, a bus or subway uh, advertisement in DC, Washington DC, right? Uh, because Washington DC, the epicenter of our you know, democracy and government uh, is very, uh, you know, what do you call it, uh, affirming. And they're talking here about the Howard Theater, referring to Howard University, you know, which is an HBCU. This is a trans person, <clears throat> um, what we call a male, excuse me, female to male trans man, trans man here. Uh, and often trans men uh, get uh, what are called uh, double mastectomies to have any breast tissue removed. Uh, trans woman. Uh, this particular trans woman, uh, as you can see, she's competing and uh, from Canada, I forget her name, but she was uh, prohibited by Donald Trump, no less, who owns the Miss Universe pageant, prohibited from competing in the, uh, what do you call it, Miss Universe pageant because she wasn't biologically born a female, even though she had won the Miss Canada uh, pageant. <laughs> Crazy. So um, another trans man, right? So they're, everywhere, right? They walk amongst us. Um, and, you know, you might ask yourself, so are these people not afforded the same opportunities and rights as other human beings because they have different body presentations, right? Um, this is a, the first uh, trans man that ever appeared on the cover of Men's Health. Um, another trans man, because, you know, with hormones and testosterone and whatnot, like you can develop muscles like a male. Um, again, a female to male trans person. So, um, you know, I, I want you all to, you know, think hard about these uh, topics, you know, that, uh, just sort of ask yourself, do you know of anyone in your family, relatives, friends, and so on, who is LGBTQI plus, or maybe you are yourself, I don't know, because, you know, pretty much online these days. Um, and if you do know of anyone, then ask yourself, do I really wish those people harm? You know, do I want to discriminate against them? Because, you know, I don't want to be discriminated against myself. Why is it therefore okay to discriminate against someone else? That's called hypocrisy. Um, so a lot of people will say, well, you know, I have nothing against uh, LGBTQI plus people. And then you say, well, what if, you know, uh, what if, one of these people were your child's first grade teacher. You know, you had a lesbian or gay uh, or trans person who happened to be your third grade or first grade, whatever, you know, language arts or math teacher. Then a lot of parents would go, oh, 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 well, I, I'm not down with that, right? So 
again, a little bit of hypocrisy to say, well, no, I don't wish harm to any of these people. I don't want to discriminate against them. But then wait, when it comes to me and my family, uh, yeah, no, I don't want them around me, around my child. That's a kind of discrimination, right? Um, you're, you know, not treating them equally. So um, that's kind of it for this topic. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot to choose from, uh, choose one. Again, it's due a week from today, May 2nd. Uh, hope you all remain well and uh, take care folks.